Gospel of John in chapter 20, we're going, read, uh, we're going to begin reading at verse 24. Gospel of John chapter 20 and verse 24. The Bible says, But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. The title of the message this morning is Read It and Believe It. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day and for this uh, time we have in your word. And I thank you for each one who's here. I pray you speak to every heart in a special way. Uh, may your will be done. May you, be, uh, may you accomplish in each heart, whether it's a work of salvation that needs to be in someone's life, uh, whether it's uh, uh, some encouragement, some strength and faith, uh, whatever it might be, Lord, may we honor and glorify you through it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. I love verse 31. It says, But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Amen. Now we have the account here before uh, John wrote that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we see that Thomas, the first time Jesus came and uh, came to the disciples and showed himself to them after his resurrection, Thomas was not there. So they got to see the Lord. And so verse 24 has, is, continues that where Thomas, uh, when he came and was with the, the, the disciples, uh, they, they testified to him, we have seen the Lord. And he, but he's, he, here's his response, is which we just read, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And so there we see an emphatic statement from Thomas of saying, unless I see it, I'm not going to believe it. Unless I see him, I'm not going to believe that he had actually had risen, that it was actually him. Now, he might have thought, you've, you might have seen someone, but uh, you might not, it might not have been Jesus. It might have been a spirit. It might have been, might have been some other person. But we uh, don't know for sure. But we might not know for sure. I don't know for sure. I'm not going to believe it until that is uh, the case. Um, how many times have you not believed something till you've seen it? Um, many times. And sometimes that's not a bad thing because there's a lot of falsehood. There's a lot of deception in the world. And uh, there are times when, you know, you really need to have some solid evidence to, to make sure you're believing the right thing. And so that's not, a, that's not always a bad thing. But here's what is very important to, to, to know and remember, realize about the Christian faith, is that it is based on faith. Yeah. And by the way, everybody believes something. So there might be those who say, well, I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in the Creator God. I, I, I have other beliefs. Everybody believes something. Even if somebody says, well, I don't really have much of any types of beliefs, well, they're still believing in whatever they think. <laughs> I mean, there's really not any exception to that. Everybody is pretty good at coming to their own conclusions and their own ideas. The imagination is a very powerful thing. In uh, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, the Bible says that without faith it is impossible to please. And why don't you go over there because we're going to spend a little bit of time in Hebrews 11. The three things about belief today that I want to uh, bring out is, number one, that belief is the first and most important way to please God. 
Belief is the first and most important way to please God. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, a very profound, very important verse. And Hebrews 11 is known as the faith chapter. Uh, The theme of that has to do with the faith of the saints of the past. And and then also uh, going into chapter 12, in light of those who have gone before us, here's how we should live. Uh, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race. And so uh, that's why I do find it so inspiring, so encouraging as we as we have uh, even this morning uh, looking at what uh, some believers hundreds of years ago went through for the sake of the the gospel, their beliefs about baptism, what the Bible says and the great persecution they faced. uh, That is something we can look back at. And yes, our our first and foremost reason and loyalty should just simply be to God and His Word. But there is something about having people come before us and for us being able to know the history and and look back and say, wow, they went through this and it gives us some encouragement for the future. And that's what Hebrews 11 does. It describes what those who've come before have gone through, what they did in their faith. But then Hebrews chapter 12 then prompts us then in light of these people, in light of this great cloud of witnesses. But in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, um, actually, let's read verse 5. The Bible says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, if you're not familiar with, the, with Enoch in Genesis, uh, he, the Bible says he walked with God and he was not for God took him. So he was one who did not see death because for whatever, he was walking so close to God, God said, yeah, might as well just bring you up with me. And, uh, and so he's translated. He was, he was changed. He was taken up without experiencing uh, the physical death. And so, but he had, it says, for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. That he pleased God so much, God saw fit. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to bring you up here with me. What a privilege that was. And by the way, that is an Old Testament type of what believers are going to experience in the future. Those uh, with the bodily resurrection, being translated, being changed, being going to be with the Lord. Those who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord Jesus. Those who are dead in Christ shall rise first. So there's that bodily resurrection and being changed, being translated in the twinkling of an eye. And but verse six, then, but without faith, it is impossible to please him for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Notice the very emphatic statement here, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Impossible. So someone wants to know, how can I please God? How can I please God? You better have some faith. Better have some faith, it, because you can't please God without faith. The Bible says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And so if you're going to please God, it's, it's got to start with faith. In uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, but Without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. So what do you need to believe? Believe that He is, that God is, that there is a God, but then that there are certain rewards to those who diligently seek Him, believing the promises of what the Bible says about those who do seek the Lord, those who believe in the Lord. Thomas um, is called, because of here in in John 20, or where we were in John 20, Thomas is called Doubting Thomas, but (laughs) someone pointed out... uh, That doesn't sound like doubt to me. (laughs) He just said, I will not believe if I don't see Jesus for myself and I don't put my finger in his in the nail prints and I don't stick my hand in his side. I will not believe. So we call him doubting Thomas. or there's that term. Oh, you're just a doubting Thomas. But he was he was pretty emphatic in his doubt and his unbelief, at least regarding the resurrection of Christ. So, first of all, belief is the first and most important way to please God. It starts with faith. It starts with belief. But it's not just belief in anything and everything. It's belief in the specifics of what the Word of God says. 
Number two, believing without seeing is the way to receive God's blessing. Now we're going to go back to John 20 and we'll see this. But while we're in Hebrews, let's read Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, starting in verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are, were, are seen were not made of things which do appear. So that first verse, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. What is that? What does that mean? Well, substance is the ground, the basis, the foundation, the support of or the confidence in what we haven't seen. So when you believe something you are, that you haven't seen, what you're doing is you're making it tangible in your mind, even though you haven't actually seen it or experienced it yet. How many of you have seen God? If you raise your hand, I'd like to talk to you after the service and hear your story. Um, how many of you have seen an angel? Once again, if you raise your hand, let's, let's hear, let's, let's, uh, uh, let, let me hear your story after the service, okay? Um, you know, uh, be careful if you, if you think you're seeing angels. I'm not saying a angels do work. God sends angels and does different things. Um, be careful about what you're seeing because Satan does come as an angel of light as well. And uh, so just be careful about that. Uh, but we do... How many of you seen heaven? Nobody's seen heaven. Um, how many of you seen... How many of you have seen the nail prints in Jesus' hands and the, the, the spot in his side where the sword was stuck in there? Uh, we haven't seen that. So... We haven't seen those things, but if you believe that, it is set up as being tangible, it's being real in your mind, even though you haven't seen it. It's the, the, that your faith is the ground, the basis, the foundation, uh, it's the support of or confidence in, even, even though you haven't seen it. Who has been uh, to Mexico City? Russ, I was trying to think of one maybe someone has. I figured, I was trying to avoid the places I thought you'd be, but okay. Uh, he ruined it. Um, all right, well, he's been in Mexico City. Well, I could still use that. Uh, how about, um, see, I was thinking, I was thinking, I'm going to, I'm skipping the, I'm, I'm skipping the, I'm skipping the European, that's right, you, you yeah, that's right. Uh, I was skipping the European ones because I thought he, he's been in Europe, they've been in Europe. Um, Anyway, we'll stick with Mexico City. We'll just, we'll just leave Russ out of it. But, um, now, I've never been to Mexico City. I don't know if I'll ever make it to Mexico City. From what I understand, Mexico City is very large. Uh, it's large both geographically, uh, large in population. It's one of the, I believe, the second largest metropolitan area in the, uh, in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, it's, it's a, I mean, just Mexico City proper is very large. So uh, very high population. And uh, so it sounds, I mean, it sounds like, wow, just a ton of people there. But I've never been there. I've never seen it with my own eyes. But do, do any of you doubt that Mexico City exists? Those of you except, you know, Russ, he's been there. He says he's been there, but none of the rest of us have been there. So how do we know he's telling the truth? Faith. You have faith. You have faith. What do you have faith in? Well, we, we, you've probably seen pictures. You know, the, the geography, the, the, the maps show that the Mexico City is there. There are other people who have testified they've been to Mexico City and they've seen it. And uh, so if I were to um, book a flight to Mexico City, and I've never been there, I am going by faith that Mexico City actually exists. And so I already have faith. That's the substance. In my mind, it's very clear that Mexico City does exist. It does exist. I mean, you could name, name any other city. You know, there, there are times, the first time I flew to Denver, I had never, never been to Denver. You know, I'd, but I flew there. By faith, I, uh, I, I got on a plane and I went to Denver because I believed that it existed. I had seen some pictures. I had heard about it. Uh, first time, you know, you can, you can fill in the blank with whatever place you want that you had never been up until that point. Um, 
And now, of course, we have so much more information at our uh, disposal because we have the internet and you can just look up something so very quickly and look at the pictures and you can, you can, you can almost know the place before you ever get to a place. Almost, not quite the same. And um, Marcel and Diane have been to Banff National Park in Canada, beautiful place but I've never seen it. I don't know. Marcel might have fabricated those pictures. He's pretty good with technology. And he put together a nice book, a nice picture book of their experience there. And uh, that was in Alberta, right? Is that Alberta? Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, that might have been fake. Who knows? Might have just made it all up. <laughs> Diane's testimony that, that they went there and they enjoyed it. That might have just been made up. So what am I doing? I'm taking... I'm taking their word, the, the, the book that was put together, the pictures, and then the testimony. And to me, I don't doubt at all that, that Banff National Park exists. I don't, I, don't, I don't doubt it for a second. Um, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, this verse really goes farther than simply geographical locations. Because we're talking something spiritual here. We're not just talking something physical. We're talking about belief in a God. We're talking about belief in the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're talking about belief in a home in heaven. We're talking about a belief in a, a new Jerusalem. And so that's so much bigger than a geographical location here on earth. That when you're talking about belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, why are you here this morning? There might be various reasons why you're here. But why, why does this church even exist? Why do I come here? Why do I preach and why do I teach and why do I pray? Why do you pray if you pray? Well, because you're believing in something and in your mind it's, it's, it's so real to you that you actually do something about it. So in your mind it's there, it's, it's real. Why do I try to live a life that's, uh, why is my desire and, and, and by God's grace, why do I want to live a life that's pleasing to God? Because I have faith that there's a, destination ahead of here, past this life. In my mind, it's as real as real, can, almost without experiencing it. But then when I really stop and think about it, I thought, actually, I, I don't even know what that feels like. I don't know what that's, none of us know what that's going to feel like, to what that experience is going to be like to slip off into eternity where your soul departs your body and you go somewhere else. We don't, know, we don't know what that's like. But yet, the Bible teaches that. And in my mind, you know, I want to be ready for that time. And so to me, heaven, based on what the testimony is of Scripture and what Jesus said and what the Word of God says in other places, I want to be ready for that time. That's why I do what I do. And then I also want other people to be ready for that time as well. That's what I do what I do. So what does that mean? It means that in my mind, it's very tangible. You can't reach out and touch it. You can't see it. You can't feel it. But based on, but it's faith makes it a reality in your mind. Now, the, uh, in verse 1 there, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It says the evidence of things not seen. Now, that word evidence is, is meant to, uh, another word that was used in, in the New Testament instead of evidence was reproof. How does reproof have to go with evidence? Because reproof is you are proving something, and, and in the case of reproof, it's pointing out the wrong that someone has done, pointing out error, convincing, what is it? Convincing them of error. But what does evidence do? Evidence is meant to convince. Evidence is meant to, meant to persuade. So faith is the substance of things hoped for. It makes tangible in your mind what you haven't seen or experienced yet. It's also the evidence of things not seen. It's that it's faith is what causes you to be convinced that this is real, even though I have never seen it. We've never seen heaven. I've never seen Mexico City in person. But, you know, we've, I mean, I've seen pictures of Mexico City. As a matter of fact, I looked it up because I wanted to see if I couldn't remember what the population was and how big it was, but I saw a picture of it. We don't have any pictures of heaven. But the faith is, I'm convinced, even though I don't see it, that it's real. Now, that means that faith is a powerful 
force. Faith is a really powerful force because you're believing things that you haven't seen. And that means it's important to be sure that you have faith in the right things. Because faith in the wrong thing, faith in, there's faith in certain things that can lead you into a really bad direction, a troubling direction. Think about those who, um, who have committed... Uh, you know, extermination of different people groups over the centuries. They had a certain faith set up. They had a belief. They were convinced of something. They were persuaded, and it caused them to do just very atrocious things. And so not all faith is a good faith. It's important for our faith to be directed in the right place. But that is why God gave us His Word. You know, we've never seen God, we've never seen angels, we've never seen heaven. Yet many people live with the certainty that they are real, completely convinced that they're real. But there are also many people who have strong faith in the opposite of what the Bible says. Now, one of the thoughts that came to mind today in, in thinking about the faith was, was the, uh, the flat earth theory. And the reason I bring up the flat earth theory, there are people who believe in a flat earth. Uh, Jordan believes in a flat No, Jordan doesn't believe in a flat earth. <laughs> Jordan and I have talked about the flat earth thing. Um, I bet John believes in faith. Oh, I don't want to tread on that ground. We haven't talked about this. Okay, I better watch out. Anyway, the flat earth is the idea that the universe is much smaller than what we're told it is. Uh, the earth is flat. The sun is like a flashlight kind of on the earth, spinning around. The earth just stays right there. Um, you know, just various, there's various forms of that theory, that idea. But there are people... And it's usually people who spend a lot of time on YouTube, a lot of time online, actually, who believe this. Because um, that's, that's where they stay most of the time. And uh, <clears throat> they believe that, that, that the earth is flat. Now, not only that, I've also seen the idea that Antarctica is not down all the way at the bottom at the South Pole. There's actually a large wall of ice at the very border of the flat earth. And I even saw someone had a rendering of it at some point of what they thought it looked like. And it looked pretty real, you know, wow, that looks real, that must be, that must be true. <laughs> but, the, but there are people who wholeheartedly believe that. Now you can try to tell them, look, I mean, there's enough photographic evidence and scientific evidence, but that's fake too, according to them. Um, NASA's fake, the International Space Station's fake, uh, the moon landing was fake. That's a deep-rooted belief in some people's lives. Think about 9-11. 9-11, the Twin Towers and the planes going to the Twin Towers. There were some who, there were different theories, and if some of the different theories of what took place and some things underhanded that were happening, you know, that's, that's all well and good. But there were some people who actually believed that no planes ever hit the towers. Do some people actually believe that? I'm thinking, all right, well, you might, if you want to uh, traffic in some other theories apart from that and you have some ideas of other people involved, who, who, what, what all happened here, okay, fine. But planes didn't hit the towers? Are you kidding? Um, and by the way, the 9-11 uh, Memorial and Museum is actually a rather fascinating, interesting place to visit, New York City. Um, I would recommend that. But... Uh, very moving just just to just to, to be there once again to see it to see it in person you know you, you can think about it in your mind but then to see the place in person is is really moving um but faith is a powerful force and so there are some who get away from they get away from faith completely they, they don't want to believe anything they want nothing to do with religion because they're just maybe fearful of what that might do to their mind or their life, or they just, they've seen too many um, variations in, in religion and what people believe. But that's why um, it's important to believe in the Word of God. That's why God gave His Word, so we would have something to base our beliefs on. Because there are so many winds of doctrine and ideas, the imaginations of, of, of mankind that can pull people in different directions.
Let's go back to John chapter 12. Actually, no, hold on a second. I, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm a little disjointed today, so forgive me. Uh, verse 3, through faith we understand that the words were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now, I love this verse, and the reason I love this verse is that Oftentimes, I made this mistake. When I would read through Hebrews 11, I would just blow right by that verse because I would look at the specific names of people from the Bible and focus on them. But did you realize that if you believe in the creator God, who, God who created the heavens and the earth, you're here in Hebrews chapter 11? You're included in the faith chapter? Because in verse 3 it says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. In other words, God created something out of nothing. God created something out of nothing. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, let there be, let there be, and, and all these things. Uh, but they came, where did it come from? It came from nothing because God who's preexistent, he was always in existence, he had the power to created out of nothing. And there are those who, I mean, that, just that belief right there makes you a kook and a crazy person in this world's mindset. You actually believe that God created the, um, oh, you, oh and, and you're especially radical if you believe the earth is only 6,000 years old. I mean, that's, that's really, I mean, how, how, how unenlightened, how backwoods can you get to believe such things? <laughs> um, well, I'm... Uh, Here's the thing. I got a book that tells me how far back it goes. If you got a book that tells you it goes back farther than that, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll consider that. But I've got a book here that uh, tells me how far back it goes and even gives specific names and ages and everything. But think about that. That makes you a crazy person. <laughs> uh, in, in, in the world's mindset, I mean, you're, you're just, you're just, I mean, you're just, just radical. Now, now, if you actually stop and think, let's look, let's look at the alternative. Let's look at the alternative. Well, we believe that there was a Big Bang in outer space. We believe there was maybe some dust or some dirt or some rocks or uh, there, were, uh, there was this, just this little tiny thing that, that just blew up and expanded and then eventually things started developing over millions and millions of years and then eventually we had a little uh, amoeba and we had a... Um, uh, so, you know, some other cells come together and then we had a tadpole and then we had a frog and then we had a fish and then we had the fish got up on land and whatever, whatever order you want it to be. And so there's still a belief that everything came from something. So this is not an issue of that there being a, an eyewitness alternative. And as a matter of fact, um, there have never been any eyewitness alternatives uh, and eyewitness accounts of one kind changing to another kind that has never been observed in nature. They, they, sometimes they'll take these fossils and they'll put them together, but you know, they'll take a couple of fossils and then they'll create this whole creature out of a couple of fossils. And, um, and they'll say, well, we found the missing link. We found these, com you know, I, I saw a picture the other day of the skeleton of a uh, gorilla and a skeleton of a, of a human. And, you know, when you look at them, you say, wow, they look pretty similar. We must have come from gorillas. No one's ever seen a gorilla come from a, a gorilla turn into a human. Um, maybe it means there was a common designer who decided, We're gonna, I'm going to make this, the gorilla skeleton similar to a human skeleton. Now, which one is actually more reasonable? That everything came from a rock or some dust? from a big bang that just randomly happened? There was a chemical reaction, well, where did the chemicals come from? Or that there was a, an almighty, all-powerful designer, the God who put things together in a special way, who holds everything together. And the Bible says here that the worlds were framed by the word of God, just like you'd uh, uh, frame a building. I love the, the, the language of that framed he just he put it together he just the master architect the master carpenter i mean he was all of it he was the the architect the carpenter i mean the engineer is everything and therefore everything that is held together by the power of god nature runs its course because of the way god set it in motion 
What a wonderful thought. I, I love that thought. What a wonderful thought. So it's through faith that we understand that the worlds are framed by the word of God. Because, by the way, nobody was there when the, other than God when the earth was formed. So for those who want to say, well, but you weren't there, you didn't see God create, well, you weren't there to see a big bang either. And I know, I, know there, I know there's some places that are trying really hard to recreate the big bang, like the God particle uh, type of thing there in CERN and, and Switzerland. There's a bunch of conspiracies about that too. But, um, but anyway, they're trying, what they're trying to do is recreate what God did. They're, good, they're trying to find that particle that everything came from. That's why they call it the God particle. Rather than just simply believing, yeah, there's a higher power. There's a God who's been in existence. He's an eternal God, the great I am. And he's the one who mastered all of this. He's the one who built all of this. And, you know, if the world thinks you're crazy for just simply believing that, I mean, it's more on them than it is on you. Because it's not crazy to believe in a God who created the earth. <clears throat> and so... Uh, I love that verse, because if you believe that, you're in Hebrews chapter 11. Um, Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You don't have to turn there. We're going to go back to John, turn to John 20. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so that's why God gave us his word, so that we would know what to have faith in. He didn't want to leave us directionless. He wanted us to know. In Romans, um, I'm sorry, John chapter 20. And, uh, and, and just to finish up on this point about believing without seeing is the way to receive God's blessing. Uh, Jesus, in his response to Thomas, or Jesus came in, he said in, in verse 27, Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach thither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Be not faithless. It was a heart issue in Thomas. It wasn't, oh, here, I'm going to satisfy your desire. Yes, he did prove himself, but he's telling him, look, your heart, is wrong here because don't be faithless, be, be believing. In verse 28, and Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Mm, now, where's the greatest? Now, it's a great statement, but where's the greatest blessing? Is it the greater blessing when you believe without seeing, or is it when you have to see it to believe it? Well, it was, it was believing without seeing because Jesus said in verse 29, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And so there's that blessing on the lives of those who have believed in his resurrection, even though they hadn't yet seen him in the flesh. So there's a greater blessing when you believe without seeing. Now, here's, here's where you got to be careful with the whole aspect of faith. That does not mean you should be gullible. There are people who believe just about anything. Uh, someone once said, you know, you could walk down uh, I, I don't know, a city street, you know, let's say New York City. I mean, you, you know, you walk down a city street, hold up any book, and you'll get at least a few people to follow you. <laughs> so that is not promoting gullibility. That would be what some scoffers and skeptics would accuse of. Oh, you're just gullible. You're just believing this stuff, you know, these fairy tales and... And uh, no, there's actually some intelligent reasons for believing it. But in the end, and there, and there are times when we, we might go to extra effort to convince the scoffer or the skeptic and say, well, look at this evidence, look at this evidence, look, here's what the Bible says, look at all this. And it really is, it's a heart condition of an unbelieving heart. There are times when no amount of reasonable convincing is going to even do the job. Reasonable arguments because it's simply, the Bible says, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. It's not that they just need the right evidence. Now, God has used some of that evidence to convince some people who might have been searching and seeking and maybe get their attention. It's not that God doesn't use some of these things of creation and scientific knowledge uh, to, to lead people to believe in a creator. But it really all comes, it does come back to it's a matter of faith. It does come back to a matter of faith. What are you going to believe? And that's why faith in the word of God is so important. 
because it, that gives us a basis, it gives us a foundation for what those beliefs are. And when you get away from that, you get into all kinds of other beliefs. And some people, even with this, get into all kinds of other beliefs. <laughs> but belief without, believing without seeing is the way to receive God's blessing. In other words, if you're going to wait, if someone's going to wait till they see God to make their choice, it's going to be too late. You can't wait to see God face to face to make your choice. The Bible says, now is the day of salvation. The Bible says that the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because there's going to come back, there's going to come a day when Jesus does come back and he's going to rule and reign. He's going to judge the unbelieving world. Uh, he's going to take his saints to be with him. And at that point, you better have already made your choice. Before then. Waiting to see him is not the time to make the choice. That's why it is a matter of faith. It's a vital matter of faith. And there is a, there is a, uh, there is a belief uh, uh, there is a, a blessing to believing without seeing. And then number three, belief is the reason that John wrote his gospel. Belief, trying to promote belief in the hearts of people, promote faith in the hearts of people is the reason that John wrote his gospel. Uh, look at John chapter 20 and verse 30. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Yeah. And so, and that's where John's gospel is unique. The theme of John's gospel is that Jesus is the Son of God. And here, right at the very end, almost the very end of the book, we see that, right, you know, in black and white, that that was the reason that it was written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Belief is the reason for John writing his gospel. He actually, that's actually repeated, and just for sake of time, you don't need to turn here uh, unless you can beat me there, but 1 John chapter 5 and uh, verses 11 through 13. Uh, 1 John chapter 5, 11 through 13. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, this, I love the way that the Gospel of John and the book of 1 John really uh, complement each other. And one of the themes of 1 John, well, let me back up. The, one of the, the theme of the Gospel of John is convincing people that Jesus is the Son of God. But based on 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, the reason he wrote 1 John, it was written to believers, was to help them with assurance in their faith. He says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. He's trying to build them up, build up their faith. And, he's, he's, uh, and that's why, and there's some, there's some challenging verses in 1 John. You say, what in the world does that mean? Um, but uh, but oh, just overall, it means... It, the, the themes of 1 John are fellowship and assurance. Fellowship with God, Christian fellowship, and assurance in your salvation. And he's basically, and he's, he's, he's uh, one of the key points of knowing whether or not you're a Christian is, well, what do you believe about Jesus? What do you believe about Jesus? He, he warns them, he says, try the spirits. And he talks about, here's what should be evident in the Christian life. Here's what should naturally come out of the Christian life is loving the brethren, loving God, and, and, uh, and then uh, obeying the word of God and the various things that are there and, and continuing in fellowship with God, very important part of the Christian life. That God wants us to have close fellowship with him. And, but he says that ye may know. He doesn't, he's not wanting to be a question. He wants there to be a certainty that you know that you know that you know that you're saved. And if you believe then I'm trying to give you this reassurance is what John does here. And so he wrote his gospel to promote belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, but then writing 1 John to promote assurance of salvation in the lives of those that did believe. 
It was the belief, it wasn't just any belief, it was belief that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The result of believing is having life through the name of Christ. And, uh, and this is really where I'm going to finish, is to read through many of the, the uh, verses in the Gospel of John to show just how this theme runs through. And I'm not, we're not going to turn here, I'm just going to read them off because there's a lot of them. But I want you to get this whole picture, the whole scope, the package of what John was writing and how it all fits with belief and, and uh, life through his name. John 1, 4 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. John 3, 15 says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. John 4:14. 4, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. John 5:24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. John 5.39, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. John 6.33, for the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. John 6.35, and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. John 6.40, and this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. John 6, 48 says, I am that bread of life. John 8, 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John 10.10, 10, the thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. John 10.28, and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. John 11.25, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And John 14.6, Jesus saith unto them, him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Recurring theme, running through the Gospel of John. That's what makes John's Gospel so unique because you don't see all of those types of statements. Uh, it's just Matthew, Mark, and John. Or they're, or, sorry, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are, are different. It's not that they're worse. They're all Gospel accounts. But John was unique in how he was presenting the Savior, that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God. And if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have life. You have your sins forgiven. Uh, You have life. It's only through Jesus Christ. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And by the way, when it comes to what you have faith in, everybody believes in something. Well, Jesus said, I am the truth. Jesus, truth starts and ends with God. And oftentimes we have this term, and I've used it here a number of times just because, just because I like to use this as an example, is that so many times in this world, oh, they're just living out their truth. They're just living out their truth. Well, who made them the determining factor, uh, the authority on what truth is? Who made... Who made each individual the, etern- the determining factor on what truth is? But that's the culture we live in. You have your truth, I have my truth. And as long as we recognize that about each other, we'll all live in harmony, we'll just all live these self-centered lives, and I, I'll just make up whatever I want that's true to me, and, and uh, you, can have, you can have your truth. What a, what a uh, slap in the Lord's face the one who is the truth, to then say, well, you have your truth, I have my truth. No, truth is truth. Whether, it, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, truth is truth. Amen. It doesn't, it doesn't ah, in this day of, you know, imagine whatever you want, it doesn't, doesn't cut it in God's sight. Read it and believe it. The, and and as, I, as I read before, Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And, 
And I just, this was not the intention of the message today, and so I wasn't going to have you turn here, but when there was a, a, a young boy who was possessed with a devil, the disciples could not cast him out. And, uh, and Jesus came and he rebuked the devil and, and he fled, he, he was cast out of the boy. And the disciples said, why couldn't we cast him out? And Jesus' response was, because of your unbelief. Because of your unbelief. And it wasn't that they didn't believe in Jesus. There was a lack of belief in the authority and power of what he had bestowed upon them that they could do. And that was a, that, there were special apostolic gifts that were given to those who had walked with Jesus and they could do certain things like that. But, you know, today there are still many people who are oppressed by the devil and devilish captivity and bondage. And I don't, I'm not an advocate for walking up to someone and just, I'm not saying, you know, on the same level of what the apostles did of saying, you know, leave, you know, devil leave. But they're with the authority of the word of God and the authority of the believer. If you believe it, you can minister to people, you can help people, and they can be delivered from Satan's bondage. They can be delivered from that. Now, it's, once again, it's not just walking up in an exorcism type of thing. But it is ministering to people with the Word of God and the power of God in such a way that they are delivered. But you've got to believe it enough to actually minister. You've got to believe the Word of God and you've got to believe in the authority of God enough that it can be done, that it can happen. We sang that song, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. There's a great spiritual battle, and we need to believe enough in that battle to engage in the battle. Believe in the power of the Word of God, that that is our primary weapon and the weapon of prayer. And so I want to extend this invitation to two groups today. One would be, if there's never been a time that you've trusted Jesus Christ and believed on Him as the Son of God, believed on Him as the Savior, the invitation is open to you today to profess your faith and not just profess, but do you believe in your heart personally in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you have a, do you, do you, uh, maybe you've been living with a certain thinking about God. Maybe God doesn't exist or God just is whatever you want to believe. It's fine. Or uh, maybe you've had an idea, some ideas about sin and well, you know, I don't really care about whatever I do. I'll just live however I want. God wants to change your mind, change your heart about that. And if, you, if God is, ta- if God is uh, working in your heart today and you know you recognize your need of forgiveness of sins, you recognize your sinful condition before God, you can believe on Jesus Christ as the only one who can save you from your sins. And so that invitation is open today that you can trust in Christ and be born again. You can be saved from your sins. Uh, then the other group I want to address is those of you who know for sure, just like in 1 John 5, you know that you have eternal life, you know that you're saved. Are you living a life full of faith? Are you living a faithful life, a faith-filled life? Or do you have the mindset of Thomas, well, unless I see this, I won't believe. Unless I experience this, I won't believe. And you're living a life that's more based on sight than based on faith. The Bible says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. The Christian life is a faith-filled life, not a sight-filled life, because there's a lot of things we see on the outside that we don't get the whole picture of what's going on in the unseen. And so maybe today you're a Christian, but you need your faith strengthened because the Bible says without faith it is impossible to please him. So I want to please him as a Christian. You know, first of all, you can't please him in a way that would get you to heaven unless you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't please him in a way that would get your sins forgiven unless you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But as a Christian, I also want to live a life of, okay, I know I'm saved. I believe in Jesus Christ, but I want to live a day-to-day life that pleases God. And that starts with faith having a faith-filled Christian life. Faith enough in the Word of God that it's worth reading, that it's worth studying, that it's worth obeying. And then faith enough in what this book says that I'm going to deliver it to others, minister to others, preach the gospel to others. Or faith that in God's deliverance. Maybe there's someone here who needs deliverance from bondage that you're in. But faith that God actually can deliver. As the song says, he is able to deliver thee. Though by sin oppressed, go to him for rest. Our God is able to deliver thee. So wherever you are today in that, 
Read it and believe it. The Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That's the importance of preaching and teaching the Word of God. And John wrote his gospel so that you would believe, to convince you to believe that you would have faith, that you'd be fully persuaded in who Jesus is, and that He is the Savior, that He's the Christ, the Son of God. Believe on Him today if you have never trusted Christ as your Savior.